This is lecture 6-4, which is all about intermolecular forces and an introduction to how they uh, lead to the properties of solid liquids and gases. It's also going to give you a little bit of information about the relationship between temperature and pressure and how that also determines the state of matter. As usual, please make sure that you've completed the learning targets in your notebook on your own first before you watch the video. So go ahead and stop it here if you need to and then restart it when you're ready. All right, let's go. So um, the first thing that I wanna make sure that is super clear is that when we're talking about states of matter and deciding whether um, the attractions that hold something together to be a solid are, um, or the, a little bit weaker attractions that would hold it together in the liquid phase where the molecules can move across each other, or the attractions are so weak that they're not able to hold them together so the molecules are all spread out with lots of space between them like a gas, the whole thing that um, is very important as you're doing this is that you have to focus on the attraction between what we call the unit particles. So you have to keep this in mind every single time. It's not what's holding the unit together as a unit. So in sodium, in sorry, let me start over because in like molecular compounds, it's not between the hydrogen and the chlorine like here. It's rather between one molecule and the other. And this is a little bit confusing because um, in ionic compounds, those forces are actually the ionic attractions. So they are what you're holding together, the sodium ion and the chloride ion to another chloride ion to another sodium ion to another chloride ion, et cetera. But, um, but in molecules, we have to make sure that we're talking about between the actual smallest unit, which is a molecule. So here goes. I'm gonna to try to explain this a little bit more succinctly. In ionic compounds, the unit particles are actually the formula units. They are actually the ions um, that are attracted to each other by positive and negative charges. So the attractions, we actually call them ionic bonds. Please remember that ionic bonds are actually just electrostatic attractions, that the damage, so to speak, has already been done when an ion has gained or lost an electron, an atom, or has gained or lost an electron to become an ion. Now it's permanently positive or permanently negative unless something comes along to react with it and change that. So the attraction is actually, the ionic bond is actually an attraction. So if we want to melt um, an ionic compound or boil, which is unusual, they're typically solids. If we want to melt an ionic compound, we have to break a lot of three-dimensional electrostatic attractions in this crystal. And because it's three-dimensional and because they're usually pretty tightly held and because the ionic attraction is strong, usually ionic compounds have high um, melting points and even very high boiling points. Often it's impossible to boil them. So, so the idea would be that that's something that you want to keep in mind. We'll talk more about this when we talk about the types of substances in the next lecture. In molecular compounds, the unit particles are molecules. They are covalently bonded groups of atoms. So the image that I have here for you is a hydrogen chloride molecule. And you can see that this bond here is the covalent bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine, just like this one. And so technically this is one small unit and this is one small unit. Um, and so if these are not attracted to each other at all, this would be in the gaseous state. If these are attracted to each other slightly, then it will be a liquid. And if these are attracted to each other really strongly, then it will be a solid. So the, what keeps those um, in their state of matter is not the covalent bonds, but actually the intermolecular forces. So picture what this word means between molecules. And that's what you want to be thinking about because it's really only molecules um, and then uh, maybe molecular elements or um, atomic elements. So, so you want to kind of keep that in mind. For atomic substances, the unit particles can be atoms, like in the metals or the noble gases, or they could be molecules, like in the diatomics. If they're, if they're atoms and metals, then the um, actually nuclei of the metals are the unit, of the metal atoms are the unit particle, and the sea of electrons is what's holding them together. But if they're diatomic, like fluorine and chlorine, then it's holding together here with covalent bonds, but then we have the unit particle of a molecule, which is held to the other unit particle of a molecule with 
these intermolecular forces, which are just attractions between them. The same thing happens in atomic elements like the noble gases. They're not held together atom to atom. They're monatomic, but they can be attracted to each other with this electrostatic attraction, which would be an intermolecular force, even though they're not really molecules. Okay, So this is your introduction to that. What you have to understand, and your book hinted at this, and this was really the first thing that you put into your learning targets this time, is that uh, the state of matter is a balancing act between the potential energy of the intermolecular or ionic attractions, which are trying to pull the particles together and um, lower that potential energy state, and the kinetic energy, which tends to create more motion or more vibration, which tends to move particles apart. So if the potential energy overrides it, um, and the lowering of potential energy is greater than the increase in kinetic energy, then it's going to be a solid. But if kinetic energy overrides it, then it's more likely to be a gas. This is not just based on temperature, however. You need to keep in mind that this relationship includes pressure as well. So this is a triple point graph, which is not on the AP exam, but is super helpful in understanding the idea that at, um, like in this case, this is for carbon dioxide, so at um, standard pressure carbon and standard temperature, which would be zero Celsius, or even if we did room temperature, which would be like 25 degrees Celsius, at that temperature and pressure, carbon dioxide is a gas. You knew that already. If I want carbon dioxide to turn into dry ice at room pressure, at standard pressure, I can cool it down to negative 78 degrees Celsius which means that the dry ice that you pull out of the cooler in the grocery store is really, really, really cold, right? So, um, or if I needed to, I could turn it into a liquid by leaving it at room temperature and increasing the pressure to, mm, who knows, these are never to scale, but definitely something that's maybe four or five times atmospheric pressure, okay? Um, or I could do some combination of the two and I could, um, increase the pressure at the same time as I cool it down, in which case um, somewhere at some point it's going to cross the liquid phase first and then turn into a solid, or I could increase the pressure as I cool it down and get to this triple point where all three states of matter would be in equilibrium, and this would be for carbon dioxide negative 57 Celsius and five atmospheres. Okay, so actually this is definitely not to scale. You can tell that. So I used to have a tube that was clear and a pressure gauge, and I used to be able to put dry ice in the tube, but we don't own that at O'Connell, so it's really hard to show you the triple point of ice. But what you would see at any of these lines is the equilibrium between the two states of matter that it's touching or at the triple point between the three states of matter. So this isn't really covered on the AP exam anymore because I think you've had it in your first year chemistry class, but I think it's kind of really important to picture that you can increase the pressure on something and that might turn the gas into the liquid. You know that already. Or you could um, decrease the pressure on the liquid and that might turn it into a gas even at the same temperature. Or you could do the same from liquid to solid. Um, it's a little bit harder just to do that by pressure. So usually liquid to solid is a temperature change difference, but then definitely solid to gas and gas to solid involves usually temperature and pressure. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're thinking your way through these states of matter discussions we have. All right, now we need to talk about intermolecular forces. This is what's largely responsible for states of matter of everything. So um, there are three types, and I've put them in order here from weakest to strongest of intermolecular forces that we worry about for states of matter. Okay, so... Um, and for the changes in states of matter, for evaporation, for melting, for boiling, etc. So um, this is the, the things that you would have illustrated in the lab, right? So the three are London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonds. These are named after the chemist Fritz London. These are not named after the city London. And van der Waals are also named after a chemist, okay? So um, all three lump together to be called van der Waals forces. Typically now we call them intermolecular forces or IMFs. Um, and then there are the intermolecular attractions between, where this is using the term loosely, between ions and dipoles. And this is usually uh, um, mostly involved in the mixing or the dissolving of an ionic compound in a polar substance, like perhaps dissolving ionic compounds in water. So we'll look at that as well, but these guys here at the top are the ones that are responsible for states of matter. So this is pretty important. 
So I need to explain to you London dispersion forces because these are the most confusing of all of them. Every single substance, even non-bonding elements like noble gases, have intermolecular forces called London dispersion forces. So we use that word molecule loosely if we're talking about noble gases. This is really, really weak in most cases, although they can be pretty strong because iodine um, only has London dispersion forces as its intermolecular force, but it's a solid. The iodine molecules are held together very tightly. So they're obviously strong enough to be able to do that at room temperature. Um, if you are a nonpolar molecule, this is the only intermolecular force that you exhibit between molecules. So this is really, really important. If you're a polar molecule, you have London dispersion forces, but often the only time we care about them is when we're comparing you to other similar polar molecules, okay? So it kind of is like a buildup of intermolecular forces. Um, Nonpolar molecules only have London dispersion forces, and these are caused by the temporary movement of the electrons in an atom or a molecule all the way to one end. We call this an instantaneous dipole. It's just random when it first occurs, and so you gotta picture the random motion of electrons, and I kinda picture it of like a flash mob of electrons where it randomly, those electrons may all end up at the end of the molecule, like they all got a text message that says, go here and dance, right? So they all end up at that end of the molecule, and as long as there's no other molecules around, it's pretty much irrelevant. There's no big effect on it, and um, they just redisperse after they're done dancing, and no one's the wiser. If you missed it, you missed it, right? But um, a lot of times what happens is that those instantaneous dipoles come near other surrounding nonpolar molecules. And this creates what we call induced dipoles. Remember to induce something is to create it or to make it happen. So what happens is that when this dipole is um, bumps up against this instantaneous dipole with its uneven distribution of electrons and this negative side and this relatively positive side bumps up against another one, the electrons in this end up being drawn toward the positive side. And now this end of this molecule or atom is negative and this end is relatively positive. And you can see that if we had another atom over here, the electrons would do the same thing and eventually all migrate to this side and it would be negative and positive, etc. So this actually can create a relatively strong attraction between molecules. Um, but it depends on how polarizable or how large the electron cloud is. So you want to picture the bigger the molecule is, the more electrons there are, um, the more polarizable it is. So I always use the halogens as an example. Cl2, chlorine has um, 17, so 34 electrons, and bromine has 35, so... 70 electrons and iodine has um, 53, so that would be 106 electrons. And you can see that um, just by having that many more electrons that can all end up at one end of the molecule, iodine ends up with strong enough attractions to hold it in the solid state, okay? Um, this is a really important distinction. Notice that I talked about number of electrons and not just valence electrons, total because it's the whole electron cloud, not just the valence electrons, okay? Otherwise, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, there'd be no difference. So you wanna keep that in mind. Often when authors talk about this, even in the lab, they ask you to find the molecular weight or the molar mass as a reference to talking about the size of the atom or the molecule. This is a quick way to figure out the number of electrons because the molar mass increases as the protons increase and the electrons increase as the protons increase. So it kind of is a quick way to decide it, but you cannot explain it based on molar mass. You have to explain it based on the size and polarizability of the electron cloud. So that's really, really important. So I made its own little area there. The other thing besides the number of electrons is where those electrons are arranged. So n-pentane and neopentane have the same exact chemical formula. They have the same number of electrons, um, all of that. They are both nonpolar molecules, all of that. So there's nothing else that's different about them except that neopentane looks like this, which is really small and compact. And n-pentane, which is the one that you used in the lab, has... Um, this long chain, right? So the idea is, is that this long chain is much more polarizable, mainly because 
if this side becomes negative, it's a big, huge region that's negative, and it would create in an induced dipole then pushing away of the electrons all to that side, and this is a large region which can be attracted to the other molecule. In here, if this side is negative and um, those electrons repel the electrons away in this and make this positive and negative, this is a pretty small region. So the more complex, the larger, the more chain-like the molecule is, usually the stronger the London dispersion forces are. So that's the hardest one to understand. Um, but definitely need to try to clear that up. So if you need to rewatch this, make sure that you go back and do that. All right, the next one, which is stronger, is dipole-dipole forces. And it's stronger because these, this is between things that are permanent dipoles. So when I say permanent dipoles, I mean polar molecules. This means that polar molecules also have London dispersion forces. So if I'm a polar molecule, my IMFs would be London dispersion forces plus dipole-dipole attractions, okay? And usually, like I said before, we only care when we need to make comparisons between things that would both be polar. So why are they different? And so, so we want to look at that. Um, Nonpolar molecules do not have permanent dipoles. They only have these temporary dipoles. So dipole-dipole forces are similar. They're between the positive end of one molecule and the negative end of another. So these would be polar molecules, and you can see that this is the positive end, this is the negative end, this is the negative end, and then this attraction here in between is the dipole-dipole force. And they can create networks like this, um, and solid covalently bonding compounds do create networks like this. Um, even liquid ones create networks. And notice that the network is a little bit looser in the liquid, that maybe the length of the attractions or the arrangement of the attractions is a little less orderly. So you wanna kind of note that in what you're thinking. Um, and so you definitely want to recognize that that attraction can be varying sizes, and the more polar the molecule, the stronger the dipole-dipole forces. So I really like this image from your book, because you can see that propane is nonpolar, and it has a um, very little dipole moment. This would be only from LDFs, so only temporary. And its boiling point is the lowest of all these substances that we see. And then you can see dimethyl ether, which is um, in Lewis structure, does not look polar um, because it looks like this. And we've got, oops, sorry. Uh, no, it does not look like that. You've got the oxygen in the middle. It's an ether, not a ketone, excuse me. So it looks like this, oxygen bonded to CH3 bonded to CH3. And, um, and so in the Lewis structure, if you draw it in straight lines, it doesn't look polar, but it is, because remember, this is a tetrahedral center at that point. And so it looks like this. If you have methyl chloride, this is slightly more polar, but not really, because this is a really small molecule. It just looks like this, where these are your H's, right? So there's not a lot of difference between those two. Um, acetaldehyde now starts to look a little different. We have an oxygen here and a carbon here, just like we did in dimethyl ether. And um, so we've got kind of some interesting things going on here. And now this one, which definitely looks more polar, has the highest boiling point and the highest dipole forces of all, right? So I just want you to recognize that we can compare then other things. If you're looking at um, approximate weight, like notice that these two are pretty close in um, molecular mass. They would be pretty close in the number of electrons, um, but this one definitely must be more polar because their London dispersion forces would be kind of similar. And actually, this one may have a stronger London dispersion forces because it's more spread out. So clearly the dipole-dipole attraction is winning in that case, all right? So if you need to rewatch that, rewatch that. Let's talk about hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are just really strong dipole-dipole forces. So um, it, I wish that long ago, when they had created the name for this attraction, they had not used this word bond, because you picture the hydrogen bond as being the bond that holds the hydrogen to the oxygen or holds the hydrogen to the nitrogen or to the fluorine, okay? This is not the case. 
molecules that hydrogen bond have to have inside the molecule a covalent bond between hydrogen and nitrogen or hydrogen and oxygen or hydrogen and fluorine. They have to, okay? These covalent bonds inside the molecule have to be there. And the reason that this is um, the case is because this is a really strong dipole moment on those bonds because they're small atoms, um, they're really electronegative because they're so small, and the length of the bond is pretty short because they're small atoms. So that attraction is really strong and it's able, the nucleus um, of the oxygen is really able to pull the electrons toward it, so much so that it almost steals them, but not quite. Okay, so so this is a really negative dipole partial dip moment compared to like on and a really positive partial positive on this molecule rather than just a kind of partial positive and negative. So that's important because then what happens is that the intermolecular attraction between the molecules here and here then is a really strong dipole-dipole force. And we set it off on its own because it's so strong and it's found only in those certain situations. It gets its own category. So we call them hydrogen bonds, all right? So it's just super important that if you're asked to draw hydrogen bonds that you orient your molecules so that the positives are on one side or region, right? And the negatives are on another and the positives are on one side and the negatives are on the other, and then your attraction is between, don't draw it like a bond, draw it like they do, squiggly lines or dotted lines or something to set it off from a bond, but it has to be between the hydrogen of one atom and the oxygen, nitrogen, nitrogen or fluorine of a, sorry, the hydrogen of one molecule or the oxygen, nitrogen or fluorine of another molecule. All right, so, um, so that kind of sums up the things that make this, um, states of matter. If you are a substance that hydrogen bonds, you also have London dispersion forces and dipole dipole forces. Okay. So, um, if you're a substance that does hydrogen bonding, you have all three and that typically makes you a liquid instead of a gas. If you're comparing things that are liquid and gas, or maybe a solid instead of a liquid and hydrogen bonds, I know, you know, from biology are the reason that water molecules can stick to each other up to go up the little um, xylem of the tree to get all the way to the leaves 300 feet in the air, right? So it's a really strong attraction, okay? Um, I just want to talk about ion dipole forces quickly. We'll talk about them a little bit more in the next section, but um, they are exactly what it implies. It's the attraction between ions and polar molecules. So you have to picture that when water is dissolving, the negative end of the water molecule is able to sneak in in between, or the positive ion, sodium, is able to sneak in in between the negative um, ends of the water molecule. So you see that what's happening here is that they orient themselves so that the negative ends of the water molecule are all surrounding the sodium and the positive regions of the water molecule are all surrounding the chlorine, chloride. And so, so this process is literally a sneak in between and form new attractions. So something will only dissolve if its attraction from the water to the ion is greater than the attraction between water and water and between ion and ion. Okay, so this is kind of, um, in order to dissolve, you have to overcome a lot of attractions and the new attraction has to be greater than the original attractions. So just kind of keep that in, in mind as we're going. All right, we're gonna practice some of this and then I wanna talk about how this applies a little bit so that you're able to look at the lab. Okay, so um, we're just gonna practice really quickly and they always want you to identify what kind of bonding or intermolecular forces you have and then decide boiling point. Whenever you're talking about boiling point, um, ionic winds over any molecules, okay, always, because ionic forces are really, really strong and they usually outrank any intermolecular forces. So ionic always wins um, because molecules, you're talking about intermolecular forces, which are weaker. So that's the first thing that you want to remember. Um, and then within 
molecules, you want to decide who has the stronger intermolecular forces. So the first one is magnesium chloride, which is ionic. The first thing you have to do is decide what it is. And PCL3, which is molecular. And now you have to decide, is it polar or nonpolar? So I'm going to draw the Lewis structure for PCL3. I would really figure out all the, val or all the valence electrons, and then I would count them up, etc. I notice that this is a polar molecule. So because it's a polar molecule, it has London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces. But there are no hydrogens in it anywhere, so there, I don't even have to question it. There is no potential for hydrogen bonding, all right? So I'm going to say that magnesium chloride has ionic forces which are stronger, and its boiling point would be higher than the weaker London dispersion and dipole-dipole forces of PCL3. And that's how you do this. So let's do another one. CH3, NH2, or CH3F. So I'm going to draw them because these are both molecules. Oops. And CH3, NH2 is actually going to look like this. And CH3F, you can picture, looks like this. Okay? So these are both polar molecules, right? Um, and, and so I want to look at this and go, all right, what's my situation here? Um, they would both have London dispersion forces. They would both have dipole-dipole forces. And yet, when I'm looking at this, I want to look at um, which at that point would be a stronger dipole force, perhaps, and which would be more polarizable. Right? So when I look at this, I'm going to guess that the CH3NH2, which is a longer molecule, could have uh, greater London dispersion forces. If I'm looking at masses and electrons, um, they're pretty similar. So um, I can't really talk about the number of electrons overall. Fluorine and nitrogen are slightly different, but you have an extra couple hydrogens. So, so you can't really talk about number of electrons, but you definitely can talk about polarizability. So I'm going to say that I think that the attractive forces um, here would be greater. All right. Uh, because basically we're looking at the attraction between molecules. All right. The next one then is CH3OH, which is going to look like this, H, 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 O, H. I start drawing them like that so that you can see that that's pretty polar. And CH3, CH2OH, which looks like this. And these are actually two from your lab. Okay, so when I look at this, um, I can see that these are polar molecules, so they have London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, and both of these have this oxygen to hydrogen bond within the molecule. So both of these have the capability of hydrogen bonding. And now I have to decide which one would be better at all of those things. So now probably I'm looking at the fact that these London dispersion forces will be greater that the, um, this one will be more polarizable because it's longer and has more electron cloud, etc. So you'll see in the data from the lab that your data from the lab follows this, that the boiling point of ethanol, CH3CH2OH, would be greater than methanol. And finally, um, hexane or dimethylbutane, now we're pretty good at this. So these are both non, oh, sorry, this is nonpolar and um, this is polar. So this has London dispersion forces only. It's a huge molecule. It has lots and lots and lots of carbon. That's a big long chain, but it's only London dispersion forces. And then 2,2-dimethylbutane is um, smaller, a little shorter, but has basically the same chemical formula. So I have to decide if the London dispersion forces plus dipole-dipole forces oops, of this would win. I'm pretty sure that because of the dipole-dipole forces, this will be good. If this hexane was a lot longer, I might be, I have to question that, but that's kind of what you want to be thinking. All right, so finally, the last thing. I'm not going to talk about this much, but this is where we're tying it into your lab. So the weaker the attractions, the easier it is for them to evaporate. Vapor pressure is created by the vapor inside the bubbles. So I really, really, really love these infographics, and I'm going to um, just show them here, and you can pause the video. But definitely you need to notice that the greater change in the temperature of the thermometer means it more, uh, 
more evaporation, which means weaker attractive forces. And the weaker the intermolecular forces, the greater the vapor pressure. So I'm gonna show this for a second. You should pause the video so that you can kind of read through the infographic. The link to this is also in the learning targets on the um, Canvas assignment. And I want you to pause the video here again so that you can read about what happens to vapor pressure below the boiling point and what happens to the vapor pressure at or above the boiling point, okay? So we're gonna keep working with this, but I wanted to give you enough of a preview that you would be able to really understand what's happening in the lab.